Church said? Amen. Amen. Please sit down. Good morning, everybody. Wow, all right. That's y'all going to be like that. It's a good morning. Even the, there we go. It, it's, even though it's raining, it's a beautiful morning. We needed this good, gentle rain. It's so nice, and I'm glad you're here this morning for our time of worship and study together from the Word. And before we get to our next pillar of faith, I've just got a couple of things, reminders about small groups tonight. Five o'clock, singing group here in the auditorium, a group back in room 138, and then in homes. So if you're not in a small group, I, I would encourage you to ask somebody what would be a good one for you and your family. It's about deeper relationships with each other, but more importantly with God. So that's a small group plug for the day. And grab you a small group discussion guide on the table. We're talking about the Holy Spirit this morning. And uh, there's only so much you can do in 30 minutes on the Holy Spirit. So a lot of this will be fleshed out tonight in our small groups. And this morning, Central 101 is our new members class. Some of you have replied saying you're planning to be there. If you didn't specifically say it's still okay, just go over to Building 316 for Sunday school in the conference room. And there you'll learn a little more about Central and how you can get plugged in. And then you can decide, hey, if Central's for you or not. It may, you may determine, hey, Central's not for me. But we'd love to have you either way. And then next Sunday is our big day, Friends and Family Day. Uh, it's going to be great. I just encourage you. We got these little cards, and I forgot to announce it last week. Little invitation cards. You can take these, drop them off to friends and family. You can write a little note on there and mail it with a postcard stamp. And uh, that's good. Also, go ahead and get on Facebook and share that invitation. Chris McKinney created a, a little poster for Facebook, so go ahead and share that. And invite your friends and family for next week. And, and read your bulletin because you'll need the, the little details in there. I will definitely get here by, by no later than 840 if you want to sit in the auditorium. And, uh, but Building 316 will be open as well for a, uh, all those who would like to do that. So, pillar number five today. We're working off this premise that as God's children that we need to be able to pre be prepared to give an answer for the reason for the hope that we have. Or in simpler terms, why do we believe what we believe? What are the important components of our faith that we have to, that, that gird us up, that support us? And with this, we've gone through the idea of God. Yes, there is a God, there is one God. He is the true and living God. He is the creator God. And he created man in his own image. And he did not retire. He is still actively involved in the world. But God made man with, cho with, with choice, with free will. He placed Adam and Eve in the garden and gave them one rule, do not eat from the tree in the center of the garden. And they did because they had the freedom to choose. And, they, and sin entered the world through Adam. And sin has wreaked havoc on mankind ever since. But God chose a people. He chose Abraham. And through Abraham's descendants, through Abraham's seed, all of the nations of the earth would be blessed through Abraham, through Isaac, through Jacob, through Moses. So Israel was chosen to be a light to the Gentiles, to begin the process of reversing the curse that sin brought into the world. And Israel brought it so far to prepare the way for the Messiah. Jesus came. And Jesus is a pillar of faith. He's the linchpin. He's the hinge upon which our entire faith rests because he is the Messiah. He is the Son of God. He is the answer and the fulfillment of the prophecies of the Old Testament. And he came to show us how to live. He is God in flesh. And he came and lived to show us how God would live if he were here walking among us. But then, according to God's plan, he, he died. He died on a cruel Roman cross to free us, to redeem us from the curse, to overcome sin, to overcome the law, and ultimately to overcome death. Because he rose on the third day and because he rose, we will also rise. And then he's coming back. That's the important part of this. He's coming back. He said he was. So before Jesus goes, goes back to heaven, before he ascends, he's got his disciples there. And they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you going at this time to restore the kingdom? They were misunderstanding what this kingdom business was all about. And he said to them, it's not for you to know the times or the days. The Father is set by his own authority. But here's what you need to know. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. 
And then you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So Jesus says, I, I'm going away. But you be prepared, you wait, because there is a power coming that is going to empower you for the mission. So that pillar five is the Holy Spirit and, and an often overlooked and ignored component or pillar of our faith. Sometimes because we don't understand and sometimes because we just don't see the significance of the Holy Spirit's role. So in 30 minutes or less this morning, from this point forward, 30 minutes from now, <clears throat> we're going to talk about who or what is the Holy Spirit and what does he, she, or it do. So that's where we're headed this morning. It's interesting because we've talked about God and we've talked about Jesus. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and void or empty and darkness was over the surface of the deep and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. See, there in the very beginning, the Holy Spirit is eternal. The Holy Spirit was there in the beginning with God at the creation just as Jesus was. In John chapter 1 that we looked at last week in verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and all things that were created were created through Him. So here's this concept all the way from Genesis 1 and adding in John 14 of the Trinity. God in three persons. Blessed Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, and the Holy Spirit. All He's, all the Holy Spirit in, in Greek language, the word spirit is, is neuter, so it's genderless. But the spirit represents the heat of God the Father and God the Son and this concept of the Trinity, separate but equal. All three parts of the Godhead, but all have a different function or role to play within our lives. In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit was given to certain people, typically for a certain period of time, to accomplish a certain task or a God-ordained mission. The Holy Spirit was not available to everyone. The Holy Spirit was a, a much like a gift that we would understand today. I'm going to show you a couple of these, and I'm going to read several verses here in Exodus 31. A couple of names you may not be familiar with, but their names are Bezalel and Aholiab in Exodus 31. The Lord said to Moses, See, I've chosen Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah, and I have filled him with the Spirit of God, with wisdom and understanding, with knowledge and with all kinds of skills, to make artistic designs for work in gold, silver, and bronze, to cut and set stones, to work in wood, and engage in all kinds of crafts. Moreover, I've appointed Aholiab, son of Ahissamach, of the tribe of Dan, to help him. Also, I've given him ability to all the skilled, I've given ability to all the skilled workers. They're about to make the tabernacle. And God has given very specific instructions about how to build a tabernacle and all of the furniture. So it's interesting enough that the general contractors for the tabernacle were filled with a special portion of the Holy Spirit so they could accomplish their God-ordained task. One of the books of the Bible that has a lot of talk about the Holy Spirit coming upon certain people is the book of Judges. When you're reading through the book of Judges, Othniel and Ehud and Shamgar and Gideon and Samson and Jephthah, you have this phrase kind of over and over. The children of Israel get themselves in a bit of a bind where they are oppressed and they cry out to God and God raises up a deliverer. And when God chooses a person, oftentimes it says right there in that verse or somewhere in their journey, the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon. The Spirit of the Lord came upon Samson. Actually, in Samson's case, Samson was filled with the Spirit from birth. The Spirit of the Lord began to stir in Samson so that they take on this special trait, special characteristics, and special power, <clears throat> excuse me, that is God ordained. We also see that when Saul was ordained to be the first king of Israel in 1 Samuel, the Spirit of the Lord came upon Saul when he became king. But also when Samuel was disobedient, excuse me, when Saul was disobedient, when Saul didn't do what God told him to do, the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. So what you see here in the Old Testament consistently 
and, it, and, and we could do this for the rest of the morning, there are times when God needs something done. He needs someone to deliver his people. He needs someone to lead his people. He needs someone to provide service in a very special way. They are empowered with the Holy Spirit who comes upon them and then sometimes leaves when said, when said mission has been accomplished. But now in the Old Testament, you have these books called the Prophets. And they begin to speak of a time when the Holy Spirit will be available to all people. So in Joel, probably the most famous is Joel chapter 2, verse 28. And I've just done a couple of verses here. But the prophet Joel says, And afterward, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. So this is the minor prophet Joel. And let's just say this is five or 600 years B.C., maybe, maybe 800. I mean, it, it's somewhere in that range, before Christ. So they, they, they're, they're preparing themselves for a time, a day, when the Holy Spirit will be evident and available to all people. And that happens, I've got on the text here, on the day of Pentecost. In Acts chapter 2, we have the day of Pentecost, and we have the Holy Spirit being poured out on those uh, disciples who were there. And Peter and the others stood up and they began to preach and they were spirit-filled and they were speaking in tongues. And the Bible says that everyone that was there heard the gospel preached in their own language. So Peter, as he's preaching, he, say, he, he, he quotes Joel 2, verse 28 through 32, about the pouring out of the Spirit on all people. And he says, today this is fulfilled. What you're witnessing right now, the people speaking in tongues, people being overcome with guilt because they've killed the Messiah, he said this is a direct result of the fulfillment of the prophecy that the Holy Spirit will come on all people. And Jesus, before Acts 2, Jesus has told his disciples. Now you have to read basically John 14, 15, and 16, which we certainly don't have time to do. But you have here, this is, after, this is after the Last Supper. John 13 is, is the Gospel of John's account of the Last Supper, you know, the, the foot washing scene. So in John 14, 15, and 16, Jesus is talking very seriously to his disciples about what's happening next. You know, John 14, he starts out, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. And he tells them, I'm going away. But he says, if I go away, I'm going to come back. But, but what happens in the meantime? So that's what Tyler read to us this morning from John chapter 14. <clears throat> Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commands. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and to be with you forever, the spirit of truth. So, so what you have to understand is this, these phrases are sometimes used interchangeably. The Spirit of Christ, the Spirit of God, the Spirit of the Lord, the Spirit of truth are all references to the Holy Spirit. And, and maybe something, I, I, you may have picked up on this, but Holy Ghost is just the King James Version's rendering of Holy Spirit. Uh, so, so the Holy Ghost, if that's your preference, works as well. But Jesus says, I will send another advocate. And guess what? Something that some people have overlooked over the years. He will be with you forever. The advocate, the Holy Spirit will be with you forever. There are some people that, that more or less believe that at the end of the first century, the Holy Spirit stopped operating, that the Holy Spirit was no longer available to God's people. But Jesus says in his, in himself, he says, I will give you the Holy Spirit and he will be with you forever. The world can't accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him. See, the Holy Spirit's always been a bit of a difficult concept for people to grasp. And it still is, but, but he doesn't have to be. So this whole section of text here is called the paraclete text. John 14 through 16. Paraclete, is, as that's, that's the 
that's the English translation of the Greek word parakletos, which means to come alongside. So Jesus promises the Holy Spirit, and in John 14, 15, and 16, even the same translation sometimes uses different words. And there are definitely variations from translation to translation, but this same word is, is translated counselor, comforter, helper, advocate, guide, encourager. That's what Jesus said the Holy Spirit will do. When I depart, the Holy Spirit will come alongside you. And when you read 14, 15, and 16, you see these different ideas. He will guide you into all truth. He will convict the world of sin. He will lead you, and on and on and on we go. So we have this understanding of Jesus saying, and even in John 16, Jesus said, it is for your good that I go away. It is, it is better that you have the Holy Spirit than you have me. And that one blows my mind. Why, how could it be better to have the Holy Spirit than to have Jesus in flesh walking among us? But that's what Jesus said, so I'm going to take him at his word on that. And then, so after you have Jesus preparing them, they remain together after Jesus ascends in the upper room. The Holy Spirit descends upon them. They're filled with the Holy Spirit. And then you have the entire book of Acts. And the Holy Spirit is on every page in the book of Acts. Our church history book, the origin of the church, the Holy Spirit is involved in every leader's lives. Peter, Paul, Barnabas, Stephen. And he empowers those leaders to speak boldly. Jesus even told them on, on one occasion, he says, when you're drugged before the council to speak, he said, don't worry about what you're going to say. The Holy Spirit will provide you with the words to say. He directs the mission of the church. The Holy Spirit is the one that's telling Paul and Barnabas and Peter where they're to go and sometimes even forbids them to go to certain places. So the Holy Spirit's involved. And then in Acts chapter 15, you have this decision-making council that meets in Jerusalem and they're debating over Judaism and Gentiles and how this is all supposed to work together. So Peter speaks and Paul speaks and James speaks and they come up with this deal. And finally James said, it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. So they created kind of a doctrinal statement, a position through the guidance of the Holy Spirit and the decision-making assistance of the Holy Spirit. But again, the Holy Spirit's on every page in the, in the book of Acts, guiding and growing and building the Lord's church there. So those are some things that we talk about the Holy Spirit doing in the Old Testament, in the New Testament. But what about us? Again, that's where the confusion seems to lie with people. And we have people on, on both spectrums. I mean, we have, there's, there's one camp of people that, that believe that the Holy Spirit really doesn't do anything anymore. Once the Bible was written, once the Bible came to be, the Holy Spirit ceased to function in any real and practic practical relevant way. And then you have the other spectrum on the other side of things where those folks believe that people can still raise the dead and can still heal and, and perform miracles. So as typical, I, I'm persuaded that the truth is in between those two extremes. But a couple of things that the Bible specifically says that the Holy Spirit does, these are from Paul's letters. The concept of ownership, guarantee, earnest, depending on, again, which translation you prefer to use. Paul says in Ephesians 1, verse 13, and you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Having believed, you were marked with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. When you were saved through Jesus, you were sealed by the Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. So this is kind of a, 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 a bit of a nebulous concept because you still wonder then, well, what exactly does that mean? How exactly am I sealed and what does this look like? 2 Corinthians 1.21, Now it is God who makes both of us, excuse me, both us and you to stand firm in Christ. He anointed us, set his seal of ownership on us, and put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. Paul uses some very similar language in the book of Romans. And essentially in the book of Romans, Paul says if, if you don't have the Spirit of Christ in you, 
then you don't belong to God. It's a one and the same deal. The spirit, of the, the spirit of Christ dwelling in you is proof that you belong to God. And if you belong to God, then you have the spirit dwelling in you. It, you don't have the option to be spirit-filled or to not be spirit-filled. And then 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 5. Now it is God who made us for this very purpose and has given us the spirit as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. So you, you may be one of those people who's still wrestling. Do I have the spirit or not, and how do I know? Well, again, that's, that's the harder concept for us to figure out, is what is our personal experience with the Holy Spirit? But what I want you to understand is, if you're a Christian, you are filled with the Holy Spirit, an indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And Paul talks about the, the, the body being the temple of the Holy Spirit, and that's something on your sheet for discussion tonight. We are indwelt as individuals and as a church by the Holy Spirit. Another thing that may be a little more clear the Holy Spirit is involved in is the sanctification process. Sanctification is the ongoing process of becoming Christ-like. So you have justification, which is what Jesus is involved in, making us right with God, washing away, tearing, tearing down the wall and the sin. Sanctification is the ongoing work of the Holy Spirit. So in 1 Corinthians 6, Paul lists off this pretty good long list of sins. All of those things that we're not supposed to do. And talking to the church in Corinth, he says, and that's what some of you were. And I can say the same thing. I could read the exact same sin list and, and say the same. And that's what some of you were. But you were washed and you were sanctified. And you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 13, But we ought always thank God for you, brothers, loved by the Lord, because from the beginning God chose you to be saved through the sanctifying work of the Spirit and through belief in the truth. See, the Holy Spirit is involved in the salvation process as well as the ongoing sanctification process process 2 Corinthians 3 18 and we who with veiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory are being transformed into his likeness with ever increasing glory which comes from the Lord who is the spirit so what does the Holy Spirit do advocate counselor guide encourager strength for daily living transformation process a seal, earnest, guaranteeing our salvation until Jesus comes back. I think Paul makes the case most clearly, at least for me, helps me see this more clearly in Galatians chapter 5. After he's contrasted life in the spirit versus life in the flesh, what does it mean to be one who is spirit-filled versus one who is not? Well, those who are not spirit-filled live according to the fleshly desires. They pursue those sinful things that he lists in, in uh, Galatians 5. But then he transitions. He says, but the fruit of the Spirit, if you want to know if you've got the Spirit living in you, this is a test. If you want to know if the Spirit is dwelling in you, the list in Galatians chapter 5 goes a long way. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So, that is, that is at least one clear way to know how that spirit thing's working out in your life. Are you filled with those traits? Are you filled with those in an increasing measure? And obviously we struggle with some of those. Patience, my goodness, that's, that's terrible. But are you getting better at it? I, I'm a lot better than I was 20 years ago, 10 years ago. As we, as we continue this sanctification process, this ongoing into the transformation of the image of Christ, it's not instantaneous. It's an ongoing process that the Holy Spirit participates in with us and leading us in this life. But if you look at your life and you're a wreck and you have a hard time with loving your neighbor as yourself, you have a hard time with loving your enemies, you're not filled with peace and joy. You're not filled with self-control or patience. This is that Holy Spirit thing at work. So here's your, your, your nickel definition of the Holy Spirit. 
The Holy Spirit is the active presence of God in the world and especially in the church. I'm not sure why I put the word especially in there, but I still like it. And especially in the church. And his presence is manifest by endowing Christians with gifts to fulfill their role in the body of Christ as we partner with Jesus in the task of reversing the curse. See, that's what Jesus said. When Jesus came and he said, the kingdom of heaven is at hand, and he went about preaching, teaching, healing, casting out demons, that was the beginning of this work of reversing the curse. So Jesus invites us to join him in that, and we say, well, I don't know what to do, Jesus. I don't know how I'm going to do it. He says, well, you'll be filled with power from on high. And you'll have the Holy Spirit who will empower you. And that's what Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 12 and Romans 12. The gifts of the Spirit, leading, encouraging, giving, teaching in Romans chapter 12. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, he talks about the body, that the Holy Spirit gives you abilities, gives you talents to put to use in your body, the church, the kingdom, for the good of the whole. So when you look at the pillars of faith in salvation history, you begin with God who created the world and everything that's in it. And, and at the creation, Jesus was there and the Holy Spirit was there. At that point, God came and walked among the people occasionally. He was there in the garden with Adam and Eve. Remember they had a couple of awkward conversations there. Uh, Eve, why are you naked? You know, that, that's kind of an awkward conversation to have with God. He talks to Noah directly and tells Noah to build an ark. He talks to Abraham and he calls Abraham to be a builder of nations. And he calls Moses from the burning bush and says, I need you to go and deliver my people from Egypt. So in the course of the Old Testament, you have God acting with his people. But then you also have the Holy Spirit given by God into the lives of certain people. And then when the Messiah comes, when Jesus comes, God in flesh, incarnate, Jesus walks among the people for about 33 years. And he lives just like we have with all of the temptations. And he shows us, again, how to live. What would Jesus do? Well, we have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John to tell us what Jesus would do. He lived, but then Jesus went back. And Jesus sends the Holy Spirit, who is now available to all people, your sons and your daughters, men and women, available to all people. So that's kind of the story of, of a, a creation to now where we are. We are God's messengers filled with the Holy Spirit. One final point that I want to share with you about the role of the Holy Spirit that some people, it appears to me, miss. The Holy Spirit always points people to Jesus. The Holy Spirit is not trying to draw his own crowd. He's not trying to have his own followers. The works of the Holy Spirit are always about building up for the sake of God's people, for the building up of the, of the kingdom, or to point people to Jesus. So sometimes when folks get carried away and profess to be Holy Spirit filled, it appears that they're trying to draw people to themselves and not to Jesus. So if you see that, that's a clear sign that they're not really Holy Spirit filled. If they're really Holy Spirit filled, then they're pointing people to Jesus and not drawing people unto themselves so that's the Holy Spirit again man this is how can you unravel something so mysterious in such a short period of time well you can't but I want to give you that I want to give you that as a pillar of your faith to wrestle with understand that the Holy Spirit is alive and well and working in you and working in the body of his church and I would contend that one of the reasons that many churches are dying is they don't allow the Holy Spirit to operate they're not listening to the Holy Spirit's guidance and leadership that Jesus promised his disciples would be with us forever in John 14, 15, and 16. The Holy Spirit is alive. And you can you say, well, I, and people, I understand it. Well, I don't really know. I don't feel any different. I've never spoken in tongues. I, I, don't, I don't have this miraculous ability to prophesy. And we say, well, I, I don't know. All I can tell you is what Peter told the folks in Acts. In Acts 2, 
After Peter takes the quotation from Joel chapter 2, Joel chapter 2, verse 28 through 32, and he says, this is fulfilled today. The people were pricked to the heart. They were cut, and, and, and they said, well, what do we do, Peter? And Peter said, repent and be baptized, every one of you. In the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's all I can tell you that I know about how you receive the Holy Spirit. Uh, There are some instances and occasions in the book of Acts that are a little bit unique from that about a miraculous portion of the Holy Spirit being given in Acts chapter 10, say, uh, in the household of Cornelius. But there's something interesting to me about this here. You remember when Jesus was baptized? He was about 30 years old. He went to the Jordan River. He went out into the Jordan River. And when he was baptized, you remember what happened? The Spirit of God descended upon him in the form of a dove. So when Peter says, when you're baptized, you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, I I think I want to be like Jesus. I want to do what Jesus did. And that's part of the transformation process. And that's when Jesus began his ministry in earnest. After his baptism, he was led out into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit to be tempted for 40 days and tested. And then he returns in the power of the Spirit and he begins to preach the kingdom of God is at hand. So for us today, that's the starting point of our journey. To acknowledge that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. To repent, to say I'm going to stop living like I am or was and I'm going to do better. To be baptized for the remission of sins. Then you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, a guarantee of your salvation, an earnest to remind you of what is still to come, an empowerment for living out your faith in today's world, and the sanctification, the ongoing process of becoming more and more like Jesus, more loving, more forgiving, more compassionate, more merciful, more patient, with more wisdom and all of those things. If you've not taken this step, that's my plea this morning, is what's holding you back? It hasn't changed. The answer is still the same. When one is convicted in their heart of a need to be spirit-filled, to be a a kingdom citizen, to become a Christian, the answer is still exactly the same. Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And I I implore you to do that today. If you are a Christian already and not been living it, the Holy Spirit has not been doing that transformation thing in your life, you probably got some sin in it that needs to be taken care of. The Holy Spirit and, 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 the, and sin are at odds with each other in your body. And sometimes you might need a little extra help in overcoming that. We can do that through prayer. But if you have a spiritual need this morning, I would encourage you to respond now as we stand together and sing this song.